Eighth Chapter The Last Night Mr. Utterson was sitting by his fireside one evening after dinner when he was surprised to receive a visit from Poole. Bless me, Poole! What brings you here? he cried. And then, taking a second look at him, What ails you? he added. Is the doctor ill? Mr. Utterson, said the man, there is something wrong. Take a seat. And here's a glass of wine for you, said the lawyer. Now, take your time and tell me plainly what you want. You know the doctor's ways, sir, replied Poole, and how he shuts himself up. Well, he's shut up again in the cabinet, and I don't like it, sir. I wish I may die if I like it. Mr. Utterson, sir, I'm afraid. Now, my good man, said the lawyer, be explicit. What are you afraid of? I've been afraid for about a week, returned Poole, doggedly disregarding the question, and I can bear it no more. The man's appearance amply bore out his words, his manner was altered for the worse, and except for the moment when he had first announced his terror, he had not once looked the lawyer in the face. Even now he sat with the glass of wine untasted on his knee and his eyes directed to a corner of the floor. I can bear it no more, he repeated. Come said the lawyer. I see you have some good reason, Poole. I see there is something seriously amiss. Try to tell me what it is. I think there's been foul play, said Poole hoarsely. Foul play, cried the lawyer, a good deal frightened and rather inclined to be irritated in consequence. What foul play? What does the man mean? I daren't say, sir, was the answer. But will you come along with me and see for yourself? Mr. Utterson's only answer was to rise and get his hat and greatcoat, but he observed with wonder the greatness of the relief that appeared upon the butler's face and, perhaps with no less, that the wine was still untasted when he set it down to follow. It was a wild, cold, seasonable night of March, with a pale moon lying on her back as though the wind had tilted her, and flying rack of the most diaphanous and lawny texture. The wind made talking difficult and flecked the blood into the face. It seemed to have swept the streets unusually bare of passengers. Besides, for Mr. Utterson thought he had never seen that part of London so deserted. He could have wished it otherwise. Never in his life had he been conscious of so sharp a wish to see and touch his fellow creatures. For, struggle as he might, there was borne in upon his mind a crushing anticipation of calamity. The square, when they got there, was full of wind and dust, and the thin trees in the garden were lashing themselves along the railing. Poole, who had kept all the way a pace or two ahead, now pulled up in the middle of the pavement, and in spite of the biting weather, took off his hat and mopped his brow with a red pocket handkerchief. But for all the hurry of his coming, these were not the dews of exertion that he wiped away, but the moisture of some strangling anguish, for his face was white and his voice, when he spoke, harsh and broken. Well, sir, he said, here we are, and God grant there be nothing wrong. Amen, Poole, said the lawyer. Thereupon the servant knocked in a very guarded manner, the door was opened, 
on the chain, and a voice asked from within, Is that you, Poole? It's all right, said Poole. Open the door. The hall, when they entered it, was brightly lighted up. The fire was built high, and about the hearth, the whole of the servants, men and women, stood huddled together like a flock of sheep. At the sight of Mr. Utterson, the housemaid broke into hysterical whimpering, and the cook, crying out, God bless, it's Mr. Utterson, ran forward as if to take him in her arms. What, what, are you all here? said the lawyer peevishly. Very irregular, very unseemly. Your master would be far from pleased. They're all afraid, said Poole. Blank silence followed, no one protesting. Only the maid lifted her voice and now wept loudly. Hold your tongue, Poole said to her, with a ferocity of accent that testified to his own jangled nerves. And indeed, when the girl had so suddenly raised the note of her lamentation, they had all started and turned towards the inner door with faces of dreadful expectation. And now, continued the butler, addressing the knife boy, reach me a candle and we'll get this through hands at once. And then he begged Mr. Utterson to follow him and led the way to the back garden. Now, sir, said he, you come as gently as you can. I want you to hear, and I don't want you to be heard. And see here, sir. If by any chance he was to ask you in, don't go. Mr. Utterson's nerves at this unlooked-for termination gave a jerk that nearly threw him from his balance, but he recollected his courage and followed the butler into the laboratory building through the surgical theatre with its lumber of crates and bottles to the foot of the stair. Here Poole motioned him to stand on one side and listen, while he himself, setting down the candle and making a great and obvious call on his resolution, mounted the steps and knocked with a somewhat uncertain hand on the red baize of the cabinet door. "'Mr. Utterson, sir!' "'Asking to see you,' he called, and even as he did so, once more violently signed to the lawyer to give ear. A voice answered from within. "'Tell him I cannot see anyone,' it said complainingly. "'Thank you, sir,' said Poole, with a note of something like triumph in his voice, and taking up his candle, he led Mr. Utterson back across the yard and into the great kitchen, where the fire was out and the beetles were leaping on the floor. Sir, he said, looking Mr. Utterson in the eyes, was that my master's voice? It seems much changed replied the lawyer, very pale, but giving look for look. Changed? Well, yes, I think so, said the butler. Have I been twenty years in this man's house to be deceived about his voice? No, sir, master's made away with. He was made away with eight days ago when we heard him cry out upon the name of God and who's in there instead of him and why it stays there is a thing that cries to heaven, Mr. Utterson. This is a very strange tale, Poole. This is rather a wild tale, my man, said Mr. Utterson, biting his finger. Suppose it were as you suppose, supposing Dr. Jekyll to have been, well, murdered. What could induce the murderer to stay? That won't hold water. It doesn't commend itself to reason. Well, Mr. Utterson, you are a hard man to satisfy, but I'll do it yet, said Poole. All this last week, you must know him, or it, 
whatever it is that lives in that cabinet, has been crying night and day for some sort of medicine and cannot get it to his mind. It was sometimes his way, the master's, that is, to write his orders on a sheet of paper and throw it on the stair. We've had nothing else this week back, nothing but papers, and a closed door, and the very meals left there to be smuggled in when nobody was looking. Well, sir, every day, I and twice and thrice in the same day, there have been orders and complaints, and I have been sent flying to all the wholesale chemists in town. Every time I brought the stuff back, there would be another paper telling me to return it because it was not pure, and another order to a different firm. This drug is wanted bitter bad, sir, whatever for. Have you any of these papers? asked Mr. Utterson. Poole felt in his pocket and handed out a crumpled note, which the lawyer, bending nearer to the candle, carefully examined. It contents ran thus. Dr. Jekyll presents his compliments to Messrs. Moore. He assures them that their last sample is impure and quite useless for his present purpose. In the year 1800, Dr. Jekyll purchased a somewhat large quantity from Messrs. M. He now begs them to search with most sedulous care, and should any of the same quality be left, forward it to him at once. Expense is no consideration. The importance of this to Dr. Jekyll can hardly be exaggerated. So far, the letter had run composedly enough, but there, with a sudden splutter of the pen, the writer's emotion had broken loose. For God's sake, he added, find me some of the old. This is a strange note, said Mr. Utterson, and then sharply, how do you come to have it open? The man at Moore's was main angry, sir, and he threw it back to me like so much dirt, returned Poole. This is unquestionably the doctor's hand. Do you know? resumed the lawyer. I thought it looked like it, said the servant rather sulkily, and then with another voice. But what matters hand of right, he said. I've seen him. Seen him, repeated Utterson. Well, that's it, said Poole. It was this way. I came suddenly into the theatre from the garden. It seems he had slipped out to look for this drug or whatever it is, for the cabinet door was open, and there he was at the far end of the room digging among the crates. He looked up when I came in, gave a kind of cry, and whipped upstairs into the cabinet. It was but for one minute that I saw him, but the hair stood upon my head like quills, sir. If that was my master, why had he a mask upon his face? If it was my master, why did he cry out like a rat and run from me? I have served him long enough, and then the man paused and passed his hand over his face. I have to stop for today. Bye-bye. Till next time with the next part of this chapter.